So welcome everyone, and I uh, hope you're looking forward to this evening's program as I am. And I'm Donna Otto, the uh, president of the South Texas Border Chapter. I'm going to give it a, well, it is now 6.30, so I'm going to go ahead. And I want, I, like I say, I want to welcome everybody who's here for our presentation. And I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Anita, Anita Westervelt. She's a Texas Master Naturalist. She has more than 6,300 hours of volunteer work. She's a retired U.S. Navy chief journalist and former federal external affairs officers. She holds degrees in communication and fine arts and is a public relations consultant, freelance photojournalist, presentation and workshop leader, blog author, and news nature newspaper columnist. She is a member of our chapter, I'm glad to report, and she um, uh, has been a welcome addition to our group. And with that, um, uh, Anita, would you like to introduce yourself further or say something more? And otherwise, we're ready for your program. All right. Uh, Jennifer, you'll have to lead me through this. All right. You need to uh, click the share button at the bottom. Do you have your so PowerPoint I do that open? before I uh, pull up the... Make sure you have your, your PowerPoint open. Okay. And now I don't have any, let's see, I'm going to get out of it. I, um, I can't see the share button if that. Did you start there. the slideshow? Get out of the slideshow. Just take it off the screen. Take it, take it off the slideshow. You don't need to close the program, but the oh, slideshow, no. the slideshow makes is full screen and that's why everything else disappeared. Okay, I uh, made it smaller and share content. There we go. We can see it now. So if you start, okay, you the don't slideshow. see the side bits. Yes. Yeah. So if you start the slideshow, then that should be good. Okay. So <clears throat> How's that? Go. Good. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for that uh, welcome and thank you for attending this presentation. If it's your first time coming to our meeting, the presentation is designed for those not familiar with the program, although experienced master naturalists should find some things of interest. So just a little bit about myself, if I can figure this out. Um, <clears throat> my first love is butterflies, and in order to attract butterflies, it's important to know all about plants, and that's generally what I talk about in my presentations. But this is different. Although it includes important native plant information, it talks about the garden as a whole. Planting plants that attract butterflies is just one step in embracing the total garden and living with the natural deep south Texas world. <clears throat> As a nature columnist and blog author, author, I write about a good variety of things native to the valley in a bi-monthly blog on their website and a nature column in the McAllen Monitor and articles in the Harlingen Valley Morning Star. And uh, these articles are useless if no one knows about them. So I tell where to find them. And on the screen is some of the websites and I'll show that later in another in another slide, but I've been a journalist at heart since I was five years old. And like most journalists, I have this overwhelming need to share information. So let's get on with it. <clears throat> Everyone wants to attract the pretty stuff, like the mysterious rain crow, whose rattle purr, knock, knock, knock can be heard in the eerie stillness of a hot cloudy day, stirring hope in those of us who believe it to be the harbinger of rain. Rain crow is an old colloquial name for the yellowbird, yellow-billed cuckoo. It's a summer visitor, favors mesquite trees and a diet of caterpillars. 
They also eat other garden inhabitants like snails, grasshoppers, crickets, small frogs and lizards, as well as berries and some fruit. But this presentation, as I said, isn't about pretty. It's about some of the other stuff that's important with our gardens. I write about all sorts of valley nature. And what I've come to know about myself is this, the more I know, the more I love. And I adopted this reckoning through guilt. I was new to Texas, came upon a bird I'd never seen before. The bird was scary, almost, dare I say, evil looking. I stopped in my tracks thinking I should quietly back away, but I'm a photographer. So I hid behind the safety of my camera and took pictures and then I felt inordinately guilty for thinking that the poor bird was ugly. I was only scared because it was something unknown to me. So how fair is that? I apologized to the bird and vowed to change my ways and not look at things in a negative manner. That's what I try to do with my writing. Inform about the nature we live around so it can be embraced, appreciated, and not feared. At the beginning of this presentation, I'm going to get you familiar with a few of the things that aren't on the A list of things we might think we want in the garden, only so you might begin to appreciate the value of things and not be afraid. First of all, this is the photo from my scary bird encounter. The bird was a cormorant. In fairness, I thought the mouth was full of teeth, you know, like an alligator. It was simply the sun reflecting off the water through its open mouth. Cormorants don't hurt anyone or anything except fish. They swim, eat fish, and rest in, eats fish and rest in the, the sun. They aren't scrappy at all. They don't fight. They have turquoise colored eyes and beautiful, enviable, shiny black webbed feet. They're spectacular swimmers reaching speeds to 35 miles an hour. We're lucky to have them. South Texas is the northernmost range of the neotropic cormorant. Cormorants don't have a lot of oil in their feathers, so they spread their wings and dry them in the sun and wind. Not scary at all. They're unique and beautiful. While we're on the subject of big black birds, vultures have a bad rap. These are turkey vultures. We have black vultures too. Black vultures' tails don't show in their flight silhouette. In the winter, you might see vultures flying around in circles like this. Don't be afraid. They're not after you or your pet. As a matter of fact, vultures do not kill, but they do serve an incredibly important environmental service. Vultures are carrion scavengers. Their scientific name, Cathartus aura, Catharitis is a Greek word meaning purify. Vultures are one of the largest birds you'll see in the valley skies. They have a wingspan of six feet. To put that in perspective, the American white pelican has a wingspan of nine feet and brown pelicans seven feet. As scavengers, when vultures clear away a carcass, they're helping prevent the spread of diseases like rabies and tuberculosis tuberculosis. You're more likely to see vultures doing their work in less than urban areas, though. The birds have an interesting ability. They use a process called urhydrosis. It's a matter of the bird urinating on itself to disinfect their legs of bacteria after feeding on rotten carcasses. It also cools them in extremely hot temperatures. Their urine, as you can imagine, has high levels of acid, as do their stomachs. So give them a nod the next time you drive by uh, and see one clearing up the roadside. Now, if you read the article, you'll know that many people don't like opossums, but I think that's because they just don't know about them. Opossums are critters of the night, so we don't get to observe them much. If we did, we'd see how beneficial they are to the garden and urban scene, not a menace or a threat at all. And they're actually almost cute. Virginia opossums are non-aggressive. They're about the size of an ordinary cat. Mostly, people only see them dead, which I admit isn't their best look. They have more than they have more teeth in their mouth than any other land mammal in North America. 50 if you were to count them. 
They bar their teeth when threatened and can look pretty ferocious. But here's what's important, their diet. Most notably, they eat disease-carrying ticks, ticks that can cause illnesses like Lyme disease and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Our opossum friends are scavengers and omnivores. They eat meat, vegetation, and roadkill. They eat nuts, seeds, grass, fruit, vegetables, grain, snails, insects like plant devouring grasshoppers, crickets and beetles, and small animals such as mice, rats, birds, and frogs. Their food hunting range can include a two mile territory and their active dusk to dawn. Now, I think I just lost. This. Let me warn you before I put up this next slide. It's of a snake. Some people shiver just if a conversation turns to a snake. So I thought it only fair to warn you. But this is no ordinary snake. <clears throat> this is a big deal snake. It's the Texas indigo. Lucky is the yard that has a Texas indigo snake. Southern Texas is its northernmost range. They eat rattlesnakes. Their diet includes anything they can overpower. And I'm missing a shot. There we go. Their diet includes anything they can overpower with their powerful jaws and swallow. Mammals, birds, lizards, frogs, turtles, and other snakes, including, as I said, rattlesnakes. Indigos are the largest species of harmless, non-aggressive snake, snake in the state, and they can live to be 40 years old. They're found in vegetative areas near permanent sources of water. Adult Texas indigo snakes don't have many natural predators because of their size, alligators maybe. Young ones are prey to raptors, dogs, bobcats, and even larger indigos. <clears throat> Ranchers and homeowners both value the snake, and you can make your land hospitable for them too by providing, providing out-of-the-way brush piles or keep hollow logs camouflaged by leaf litter. And just so you know, a snake flicks its tongue just to get a sense of its environment. It's collecting odors that are present in minuscule moisture particles floating through the air. I think it's incredibly amazing. Texas indigo snakes are on the threatened list in Texas and cannot be hunted or killed. As I briefly mentioned, this presentation isn't about pretty, but if many of you know, I'm intrigued with scat. So with that in mind, never be afraid to check out scat or up chucky stuff because you never know what you might need to know. Like what's roaming around at night and should I keep my pets indoors? Coyote scat is generally several inches long, the di diameter of a cigar, and tapered at the end, as these amazing specimens show. Coyotes eat small animals, birds, and insects. The color of their scat ranges from dark black to gray, depending on the diet. The scat is typically filled with fur and bones during winter, as you see on the right of the slide and seeds and berries during summer in the photo on the left, which is full of seeds from a prickly pear tuna. Now, this is fun. One morning I had a surprise on the driveway, armadillo scat in all its glory. I knew instantly it had to be, and it was verified by an iNaturalist. This area is about seven inches in length. And what's weird about this is that it seems to replicate the ridges of an armadillo's armor and base of tail. Armadillos are harmless. They eat things we really don't want hanging around like termites, cockroaches, grubs, mm -hmm. as well as beneficial things like small amphibians and reptiles. Now, just one more scat and then we'll go to another interesting subject. But who doesn't love butterflies, right? Well, to have butterflies and moths, of course, you have to have caterpillars. This is the giant leopard moth and caterpillar. The caterpillars can get up to four inches long, big, thick, and fuzzy looking, something our rain crow in that first photo would eat. The moth itself is spotted and beautiful, about one and a half inches in length, and it has lovely blue feet. Caterpillars, no matter what species, eat a lot, and when they eat, of course, they leave a lot. In the caterpillar realm, it's called frass, not scat. So don't think your plant is diseased when you see little droppings. And you may be familiar with the adage, 
about caterpillars. If it's fuzzy, don't touch it. It might sting. Okay, no more scat, but something just as intriguing from the opposite end. Some birds uh, don't digest all of what they eat. These are owl pellets from a barn owl that I found under Washingtonian palm. They are about two inches in length. Owl pellets, uh, by the way, these are great horned owl pellets on the left. And if you can see the shiny little red eye, that's the great horned owl in another palm tree. But owl pellets are the indigestible materials from what the bird has eaten, including feathers, teeth, fur, and some bones along with the owl's digestive fluids. The pellets are not scat. They have not passed through the owl's digestive system. They have been ejected because they can't be digested. Owl intestines have weak digestive enzymes. They can't break down hard to digest materials. Matter that can be passes through. The rest is held in the owl's gizzard. When the gizzard is full, an owl will stretch its neck up and forward, open its beak and eject the pellet without retching. Owl pellets have no smell and are interesting to pull apart to see what a bird's diet is. But do be cautioned. Consider wearing medical type gloves and a mask that covers your nose and mouth uh, in order to protect you from bacteria like E. coli and other harmful things that might be present. The pellets can be found underneath an owl's favorite roost or when found can alert you that, to the fact that you do have an owl. Owls, large ones, are aggressive carnivores and will rid an area of rodents, skunks, and rabbits that feast on plants, roots, and fruit. However, they likely will be snapping up smaller birds. It's a double-edged sword. All right, let's get off the ground and into the bushes. Living with the natural world means living with things we think are icky or yucky like bugs, but if you start looking to them instead of unsuspectedly having them fly at you, they can be fascinating. Bugs are important. I practice or I participate in bio blitzes. And if you don't know, a bio blitz is where you search for certain things in nature, photograph what you find and upload pictures to databases. I join ones about native plants, pollinators, insects, and such. I also set up a moth sheet, thanks to Joseph, and black light apparatus during the months when the temperatures are above 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Just briefly, this is what my setup looks like in the photo on the left, an old camera tripod and a couple of shop clamp lights. On the right, you see it in action with the black lights drawing in moths and insects. Mothing is a different topic altogether. You can Google about mothing or go to the link indicated on the slide where one of our chapter members, Joseph, has written about it in extensive detail. And just out, uh, mothing is fun. It certainly tells you what you're living amongst because the black light attracts a lot more than moths. And these are some of the pre-dawn results, moths, bugs, hoppers, cicadas, dragonflies, bees, and a book recently out Texas host plants for moths that's exciting to those of us who like to know what to feed what to feed plants or what plants to grow in order to feed moths. And it's uh, from Tammy U Press, and that link is on the slide. And I must say, mothing attra is, attracts all sorts, like those looking for a midnight snack. I check both sides of the moth sheet and often find one or all of these happy freeloaders hiding at the back side. And these are three species that are an important part of the makeup of a garden, the common Mexican tree frog, Mediterranean house gecko, and Gulf Coast toad. They eat, and they eat insects, lots of insects, especially those that, of course, come out at night. You may want to photograph this page or check the chat for the links. There are two upcoming citizen science bio blitzes open to the public. And um, you can also Google Pollinator Week 2022 or Google National Moth Week 2022. 
the pollinator bio blitz began today and runs through Sunday. Uh, so it's not too late to get on the bandwagon with that. And uh, you might want to um, join the pollinator project through iNaturalist. I was having some trouble today, so hopefully it's going to be fixed tomorrow and and uh, more of the observations will be listed. So, okay, I promised I'd get you out of the bushes or into the bushes. And when you sneak up and photograph bugs and insects, then enlarge them on the computer, they're more than just something annoying flying at your face. Some bugs, like these stink bugs, incredibly, are even rather attractive, and not all stink bugs are, dis are destructive. The black stink bug on the left of the slide uh, seems to help keep away pests from farm fields. They forage for insect larvae on cotton, soybean, and citrus fields. They also feed on plant juices, but never reach high populations, so their damage to plants is minimal. Some stink bugs suck the sap from plant stems and leaves, and in large numbers can destroy food crops. On the other hand, birds, bats, spiders, assassin bugs, predatory stink bugs, and parasitic flies eat stink bugs. Mostly, like the green stink bug on the right, they're not found in swarms that would decimate entire neighborhoods. So with that in mind, I don't generally kill bugs. You know, it's not easy being a bug. By the end of the day, they'll probably be something's meal. If not a bird's, then some reptile or other critter. Common in Texas are other stink bugs, and they can do damage to agricultural crops, crops especially those in the genus Euschistus. Now we're coming to the section most people want to hear about, a garden full of pretty blooming plants. When it comes to plants to choose for your garden, though, it sometimes gets complicated. Incidentally, not all bugs and moths have common names, but they will have a scientific name like this one, the Acmeodera scalaris. It's a species of wood boring beetles. I know that sounds scary, but just wait. This colorful bug is on a colorful flower of a bushy plant called cheeseweed. The plant's botanical name is Malvastrum americanum. It's also known as Indian Valley false mallow. Mallows, especially native ones, are prolific seed spreaders. In a drought year, mallows may be the only thing blooming and going to seed, feeding so many seed-eating birds and critters. But in a lush year, they may produce more plants than you'd like on your property. Cheeseweed is not a particularly popular mallow, but it's reputed to help protect the soil and furnish color cover for some wildlife. On the downside, it's a host plant for cotton bollworm. On the flip side of that, cheeseweed is a larval food plant for the striking Laviana white skipper butterfly. A number of mallow species host other butterflies, especially the, the skippers. My philosophy is if a plant begins to get out of hand, I'm prepared to eradicate it. So we come back around to the initial photograph. A lot of people think caterpillars are yucky. This grand fella is the awesome caterpillar of the beautiful orange barred sulfur butterfly. On the left is its unique looking, looking chrysalis. Sulfur caterpillars eat a variety of plant leaves, buds, and flowers in the pea family. This cat is on a Uvia d'Oro tree, a tree not native to the valley, but popular. Nonetheless, it's a known, a known food source. One thing about caterpillars, they don't eat the stems and roots, so the plant can continue to produce leaves and flowers. Caterpillars are more important than you think. University of Delaware entomology professor and New York Times best-selling author, Dr. Doug Tellamy, reports that caterpillars contribute the most to ecosystem function, that in terms of sustaining food webs, caterpillars transfer more energy from plants to other animals than any other plant eaters. In other words, caterpillars and herbivorous insects pass plant-made nutrients up the food chain to animals that do not eat plants, 
such as rats, bats, lizards, frogs, birds, and a variety of invertebrate. As herbivores, they transfer plant nutrients into a form palatable to predators. And this information is about his latest book, Nature's Best Hope, that's really pretty cool. As beautiful as butterflies, moths, and many bugs and or their larvae are, they also are nothing more than part of the food chain. Lizards, birds, and mammals eat bugs, butterflies, moths, and dragonflies, as well as their larvae and even their chrysalis or cocoon. No matter what the critters look like that share your garden with you, they're all important, all mostly benevolent, but certainly not anything to fear. Now, as promised, some exciting native plant information to help you select plants for your garden. And please feel free to take a, a photo of this slide. Plants make the habitat go round, food for insects, reptiles, mammals, birds, each sustaining itself and something above or below. The best thing we can do is provide that habitat. Dr. Tallamy maintains the, that such a habitat can be as small as a four by four foot square area in anyone's urban lawn with some specifics. Layered landscapes using mostly native plants that are useful to insects in your area. Flowering plants in compact groupings, three to five to seven of uh, thin plants that, that, that bloom. Native shrubs and trees of varying sizes and shapes for food, shelter, and nesting. Brush piles and leaf litter for grand dwellers, big and small. So how do we provide that habitat? In the valley, these are just a few native plants, shrubs, and trees that can get you started developing a habitat that will house caterpillars, bugs, and other critters, and bring in beautiful butterflies that, in turn, produce caterpillars that feed birds. These are a few of the plants that I have. In the last three years, I photographed nearly 200 moth species, 70 butterfly species, and lots of bugs, birds, and critters on our property. And as Joseph mentioned earlier, if you are on, that's where mostly that I get most of my information to write about. So very briefly, let me go over a few plants of why you might want and why you might want to have them. It's important to have something blooming and providing nectar all year long. And we can do that with the climate of the Rio Grande Valley. The next few slides show different plants, some that weren't in that previous slide, but do note that I've highlighted the typical bloom period on the slide. And anything I say is contingent, of course, on a year where we don't have some sort of tragic weather event. So pink mint can bloom in December through spring. During December and January this year, I photographed 19 species of butterflies, including a monarch, a couple of moths, a few flies, and two wasps seeking nectar from these blooms. Note on the inset, the tiny dusky herpetogramma moth and the plant seeds in the groups of four at the bottom left of the insert. Pink mint will gloriously reseed itself. I had butterflies in those two months that I'd not seen in my yard for a couple of years, like the common buckeye in the top right corner and the southern dog face, the yellow one on the bottom row. Now, some of you are going to think I'm crazy. This is not a weed. This is Texas thistle. It can get to five feet tall and more. Amazingly, its thick, wickedly painful leaves are a larval food plant for the delicate painted lady butterfly caterpillars and other insects. It's an early bloomer. It provides nectar and pollen to a lot of insects, and it's really pretty. Numerous birds eat thistle seeds, even use the fluff, fluff in nest building, and you may not be able to purchase this plant, but if a rosette appears in your lawn, leave one just to see what happens. Many native plants bloom all summer long, like the ones on that busy slide. This is Texas lantana, a heat of summer bloomer. Frostweed, on the other hand, uh, is a big variety, draws a big variety of insects to it, but it 
usually only blooms uh, beginning in the fall. The plant can grow to about six feet in height, and it isn't exactly shape, shapely, but it's certainly an interesting one. And busy, especially in late September, October, and November. And these were photographed during a Texas fall pollinator bio blitz. This is a must have plant, I think, for anywhere. This is um, mostly fall blooming. It's mist flower, also called Crusida chromoliana odorata. It's amazingly attractive to butterflies and an excellent source of nectar. Fall blooming mist flower seems to begin blooming spot on on October 1st in my yard, and it will bloom profusely through the month. Crusida, Crusida can continue to have a few blooms during the winter if watered, even when most of the shrub looks dead. And I must admit, I have a small volunteer bush coming up under the shade of a mesquite tree that began blooming in May. So I can't now uh, hold to the October 1st. But the shrub is a sprawler, and after October, it can start looking shabby, but it's definitely worth having. It draws insects in October like pink mint does in the winter. And just depending on the size of your yard, I certainly recommend at least one. In my opinion, uh, and strictly, this is my opinion, once lantana and mistflower shrubs quit blooming, I think the best thing to do is pull them out in the spring and replace them with new plants. But mistflower is more than likely to reseed itself somewhere in your yard, as I mentioned about the one blooming under a mesquite tree. Some native plants bloom during all seasons. This is heliotrope. It's one of those that blooms all season. It's an excellent short shrub, generally less than three feet in height and mostly a compact shape. As you can see, it's attractive to butterflies, bugs, wasps. Wasps, by the way, are pollinators. And these three plants are included in that earlier busy slide, but I want to call your attention that they can bloom during all seasons, like the heliotrope I just spoke about. On the left is the Texas olive. It's a tree, relatively slow growing, but eventually can get to 20 feet or more in height. In the middle is snapdragon vine. It's very prolific. It's tiny. The flowers and leaves are about the size of a nickel. It appears delicate, but will twine in and around and over anything. It does not seem to smother or kill other plants and is easily pulled out if it gets to be too much. On the right is tropical sage, and it and snapdragon vine will both happily reseed themselves. In addition to attracting butterflies, bees, and other insects, these three plants are favorites of hummingbirds. We're just about to the end of this presentation, but just a few more bits of information. You might want to uh, photo. You might want a photo of this slide as well. And I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, Jennifer is putting the the link in the in the chat. Nectar is not created equal. Some plants are richer with nectar than others. Several years ago, Mike Quinn, a, a Texas Parks and Wildlife invertebrate invertebrate biologist now somewhere in the San Antonio area, compiled a list of nectar ratings from fair to excellent for the National Butterfly Center in Mission. I've listed only a few popular and easily obtainable plants on this slide, and the link to Mr. Quinn's PDF is at the top of the slide. Now, before you go, as Texas Master Naturalists, one of the things we're charged with is educating the public, and we do this in a number of ways. We advise groups about native plants, trees, nectar, and pollinator gardening. We have monthly meetings that are free and currently offered online. What I'd like to call your attention to is our Speakers Bureau. I've lifted, listed only a few of the topics. And to our newest members, as you become proficient in areas of interest, we hope you'll consider developing presentations and adding your knowledge to our speakers bureau topics of available uh, presentations and demonstrations. To the general public, 
We give presentations or demonstrations to groups, clubs, and nonprofit and non non uh, political organizations. Most presentations are about 40 minutes long, designed to be electronically projected, allow for questions and answers, and some can be tailored to 20 minute stand up lunch bunch informational programs. We also offer an overview of the Texas Master of Naturals program and how to become involved. And as promised, if you've not navigated our chapter website or haven't looked at it lately, here are some of the links we like to point out. Links to the list, the full list of the Speakers Bureau topics, information about mothing, a list of Valley Native plant growers, so you can uh, uh, call and see when they're open and where, where to find the, the native plants, and how to join the organization. And here I, I'm on two websites, and I have links to seven years of articles about the habitat of the Rio Grande Valley. And with that, I thank you for listening and how to live with the natural world. Okay, I, uh, we're open to some questions for our presenter, and I think there was one in the chat that asked about the lantana, and um, I was look, trying to scroll back to it. Tony, was that, uh, the lantana gets sickly and I have to trim it at least annually. What's going on? Anybody have some comments about that? First of all, do I need to press stop to unshare? So at the bottom, this well, where there's the a share button was. There's a stop at the top. Yeah, do that. Yeah, that'll do that. Oh, good. Okay. There all right. Go. Yes. Now the question. Oh, it was um, about the lantana. The uh, they get the disease on them. Uh, let's see. I I have an answer for that, and it's Mike Heap's answer, and he says pull it out by the roots. Throw it away. Don't put it in a compost pile. And um, don't plant it in the exact same spot. Okay. Yeah, what I've been told about that is, I think it's a, is it a fungus or a bacteria? But I think it's both. It uh, it's spread by insects, and once your lantana gets it, like she said, the only option is to get rid of the lantana. I don't. I just leave them there because they're going to get it again eventually. Um, I don't like replacing my plants every year. I just let them do whatever they want. If they come up, they come up. A uh, bird planted it there. That must be where it should go. Well, and as a matter of fact, I, that's a good philosophy, and I, I do a lot of that. The thing with that, I don't know, and I haven't asked, which is why I don't know, if that disease might spread to something else. But I just, I get rid of it. I'll, I get a lot of pop-up volunteer lantana anyway, so I'm safe in, in pulling it up and destroying it. Anita, I asked the question, and I trim it every year, and I haven't had any babies come up in my yard, so I'm keeping it. I just have to trim it every year because it gets sick. Um, well, it gets sick every year, right? Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, if it's not dangerous i don't think but, i don't see it in any other plants so um yeah and i have not i've i've seen it actually in my uh camara lantana the pink and yellow one the indian west indian one i i see it in that and i but those i've never planted they just i get like joseph said a bird dropped it off and and i do i get rid of them because i get i get lots of them I don't get as many Texas lantanas come popping up like I do the camera, lantana camera. What's the difference in Texas and the camera? The Texas is the one in the picture. It's the, the brilliant orange and reds. The camera is the, the pastels, the pinks, yellowish, whitish blooms. I'm going to have to go look. <laughs> Okay. Oh, yeah, you know, uh, Plants of Deep South Texas has all the colors, the white, the velvet, the, the, the violet, the yellow. I looked it up. Uh, it's, it's a, 
bacteria called phytoplasmas or the genuses. Uh, You're right. When I said it's both, I was thinking of something else Mike Heap was looking into one year, and that was the year the prickly pear cactus were dying in Ramsey Park in Harlingen. And he had looked at some under a telescope, and he had said that it's both bacteria and um, whatever the other was, fungus. Oh, and I think I saw it's uh, it was somebody told me it was called aster yellow disease. So it probably does affect some of the other, uh, like sunflowers and stuff are in that same family. What, the lantana thing? Yeah. It just, oh. it, it probably appears different because I know I've seen like dual flowers on sunflowers or where the, the petals get really weird. It may well, you know what that is? That's, um, that's just an anomaly that happens. It's called something. I can't remember the name. I wrote a story on it. I'll send it to you. Okay, and we have a couple more chat questions. Uh, the, Elizabeth says the same thing happens with Turk's cap. The, they get the bumps, as uh, said, so she does a lot of pruning on those. Um, I've read the, that on those, it's a, a type of mite that lives in the leaves. I think you're right. You're right about the mite. And and I don't just, I, I probably have that, but I don't do anything about it on the Turk's cap. I do kind of, take out some of my turps cap it in the winter it comes back yeah it really resistant to freeze it, it just yeah. pops right back up um here and kathy asks what's your top plant my top plant iris <laughs> <laughs> and um hibiscus sorry it's not native i uh, but i i lived elsewhere and my love of plants goes back to when I was three, so I can't I can't change it. <laughs> Isn't hibiscus native to China, right? Um, I think so. Kind of. It's it's um, yes yes it is the Orient uh, it is. You'd think they're tropical because we see so many of them in the tropics, subtropics, and tropics. There's actually two, and if you talk to the older gentleman with all the diamonds at, at Grimsel's, he'll tell you all about them. Ah, but he told me I couldn't quote him in a story. <laughs> anyway, uh, there are the hereditary um, hibiscus don't do well here. The, the tropical ones do. And, and he says he'll sell them to people and they put them out in the hot sun and they, they come back and say, well, it died. Well, he says, yes, but the, the, the historic ones uh, don't do well in the heat. Maybe partial shade, yes, of course, but. I think they're subject to root rot, right? If you water them too much? Um, if they're potted, yeah. I wouldn't, I don't suggest putting stuff in pots here because you're right. It, it's hard to judge. But they they do like uh, well-draining soil. I think purple sage, you can't water it too much either, I've learned. Oh. Isn't uh, the heartleaf hibiscus, that's a native here, isn't it? It is native, but it's fragile. Mm. And uh, they, they really don't have a lifespan uh, longer than about three years. It's an understory plant too, the heartleaf hibiscus, I believe. That's right. Yes, it's one of the few things that can grow in the shade. It's one of the few things I know about plants. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's a good thing to know. <laughs> yeah. in, in chat, Elizabeth Eddy asks, uh, will the pink mint grow in the same beds as lantana? I, I think pink mint will grow in the crack of your sidewalk. <laughs> um, yes, pink mint will probably it, it's, yeah, as a matter of fact, I, I know of a field of it in Ramsey Park. Mine's separated, but I have four acres, so I can I can do that. But um, pink mint is just, it'll really, really recede itself. You don't have to worry about it. Speaking of plants that grow in the crack of your sidewalk, 
do, have you identified any of those? Because there's some that occur in my driveway, like all the time, they just keep coming back. Oh, I do actually. And I have, I, maybe I'll write a story about it. Good. <laughs> one, of the, one of my favorite plants is, that grows in the crack of the driveway and, and a sidewalk is uh, Berlandier's trumpets. Mm -hmm. It's it opens at four o'clock. It's it's um, pollinated by moths, and um, it closes at sunup. It's beautiful. I'll I'll do it. I'll do a sidewalk garden. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> are there any other questions? Uh, people are welcome to unmute and and ask if you've got any further questions for Anita. Well, Anita, we've thoroughly enjoyed it. And now I'm going to have to start looking for those plants in the cracks of my sidewalk to see what I see. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, send pictures. I'll do a story. <laughs> a great idea. Great idea. Thank you so much. It was very informative and very, very enjoyable. A nice, relaxing, interesting program. Thank you oh, so thank much. You. Thank you. Okay. And so for those of you who are watching this that are members that want this for advanced training, that was right at 45 minutes or 0.75 hours for advanced training um, on the program. Be sure and mention Anita's uh, program at our general meeting. And with that, we're going to go ahead and uh, go into our uh, business meeting. So thank you again, Anita. Okay. Um, Treasures report. I attached the treasures report for everybody to review. We have the um, the budget that shows our revenues and expenses, and then we also have the finance report, which showed what was happening back in May, because that's the report we got at, at the first of June. And I'm not sure if I saw Gail Rice was on here or not. She is our treasurer. As always, if anybody has questions about these reports, you can check with Gail. She's our expert. And um, she'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. Yes, Gail is here tonight. And yes. I'm here. Yeah. Um, I do. I think I mentioned it later in the report at the board meeting, because we've not had some of the expenses this last couple of years that we've had in the past at our board meeting, we uh, voted to send $500 to the state meeting as a supporter of the state meeting they were asking for supporter donations and they will recognize our chapter for doing that and have our chapter name on programs and slideshows and stuff in recognition of our contributions so we thought that was a worthy use of some of our excess funds i know i have not attended the state meeting the last couple of years did it virtually and such and so we had some funds available and thought that appropriate so thank you very much, Gail. If no one has questions, then we will file the financial reports for our audit. I will turn on my camera. Thank you for reminding me. There, now people can see what I'm up to. Uh, also enclosed or attached were the minutes of the last meeting. And um, I, I went back over it real quickly and didn't see anything that needed changing. Or correcting and so um, again if you have any questions about those or any uh, need to make changes or um, add I know there were a couple of blank spaces for people's last names if you notice and want to fill in your last name uh, let me know and I'll have a copy of that on file right now we're having a couple of different people do minutes for us so if you have any changes or updates to any of the minutes just advise me so we can make those changes and otherwise we will um, have those uh, on file. The um, next bit of information is committee reports. Ronnie was not here and he did send some files. I don't know if Jennifer has those to show. I did go ahead and attach them as an attachment to our minutes so people could look those over on our monthly reports. So um, Jennifer or Joseph, do you have those to show? If not, I can just review the information. I don't have it ready to go right now. Okay. Me neither. 
All right. Um, like I say, I attached them so you could see those uh, details. He said there were 117 hours. Um, oh, no, yeah, entry eligible members, uh, 34 unique members logged service in 80 hours through 16 service opportunities. So we had 30 members logged volunteer hours and 20 members logged AT hours. Um, then he also mentioned um, 450 total approved service hours for a worth of $12,843 worth of impact. They value that our volunteer hours at $28.54 an hour. Uh, we had a direct outreach of 230 adults and 16 youth and 26 and a half total approved advanced training hours. So that's his report. And um, um, Elizabeth, I do have uh, th that was attached to the minutes if you want to repeat any of those details from those slides. Uh, Anne, Anne is here tonight. I think she's still on here. Do you have anything you'd like to say about the up the, our next class for 2023? Okay, uh, Jim and I have been having uh, some meetings and we have the schedule of classes uh, completed and the field trip schedule completed. And we'll be sending them out to the members of the education committee before our September 1st meeting. And then once we discuss it and it's, and it's a final, then I'll send it out to the board members. All right. That's one thing. And then the second thing is um, we are, I am planning to have our classes in person and Jim is talking about doing in person and virtual, which he will take care of. Um, we are going to let Joseph off the hook on um, having to plan and set up these meetings. I mean, he's been doing it for several years and we appreciate everything he's done and the hard work he's put into it. So we want to give him a break this year. So we have three members looking into a place for our meetings, if it's possible for us to do that, as long as COVID um, doesn't rear its ugly head again and the state put the kibosh on our in-person meetings. So we just have to see how that goes, but if we're prepared, um, we're prepared to do it either way. So that's my report. All right, and I do know Joseph has sent me the name of a couple of people that I've included when I do the email for our programs and stuff uh, that are interested in the upcoming class. So we're we're getting interest already, and they're looking at that um, uh, being in the know. So we'll be sure and post that information on what I send out to interested people. So thank yeah, you. Okay. And uh, River is here tonight. River, do you have anything in the area of awards and recognitions? Yes, I do. Hello, everyone. Hey. And if my cat, Abby, will get off of my cheat note, I can read them to you. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have four recertifications. Julia Jorgensen, uh, Charles Russell, Michael Doyle, and Janie McGee. We have two one-hour milestones, Rudy Escobar and Charles Prossel. Okay. And we have one 250-hour um, milestone, and that is Arturo Contreras. All right, Arturo, congratulations. Congratulations to everybody. And you might... Um, River, if you don't mind, would you be able to email that list with the names and the awards to Elizabeth Eddy? I'm putting it in the chat for her. I'll send it. Okay. I have one more name to put. Actually, maybe it went. I hope it went. I don't know. But anyway, yes, I'll get it to her. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Congratulations, everybody. Uh, Joseph, do you have anything about communications and what you've been up to? Um, not much I can think of. I'm looking at the website statistics right now. Uh, we're, we've had uh, 249 users in the last 30 days, which is uh, down 70%. So I guess everybody's on vacation right now. They're not visiting our website too much. 
Uh, but like you said, we are still having people uh, interested in the classes contacting us through the website. I've had two or three in the last month or two. So um, uh, we're still getting people uh, interested. Okay, very good. And I know we've heard from Anita tonight, but Anita, do you want to share additional information with us? I know you had sent me a note about uh, you were providing some information to the um, South Texas chapter, right? Yes. Um, uh, they have a newsletter and I emailed the editor and uh, mentioned that I do some native nature writing for the valley and that uh, the geography, of course, is similar. And I wondered if he might want some of the articles. So I'm going to contribute uh, some some stories to his uh, newsletter. It's a monthly, uh, once a month. And uh, if it's pertinent to, and this is the, the chapter with the three counties just north of us. So, uh, on, and coastal, that north, north and east, uh, wherever it is, it's above us. All right. And uh, in addition to that, I have corresponded with, the, uh, I don't know, I think he's the manager or the, the director of the South Texas Echo, South, wait, what is it? South Echo. Texas Echo Tourism Center mm -hmm. over in uh, Laguna Vista. <clears throat> and I will be posting or rather marketing uh, my blog and then the stories on their Facebook page. That's good. So, I, and he agreed with me that the, the content would, would serve his audience as well. So. Great. Great. The more we can get the word out, the, that, that's great. And that's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah, that's good, good news. Thank you so much. Um, uh, how about other officer announcements? Uh, Kathy Ton, I know is on here. Kathy, how are you and Pierre doing? Are you uh, available to make comments? Pierre and I say hi to everyone. Uh, what we did is uh, last week, we had a talk with Ronnie and River, and we reached out to members who have not paid yet this year. There's quite a few, it's kind of shocking. But we did send out a, a personalized email to all of them, and Peter added his name at the end as member at large, that if they had questions about the chapter or what we're doing to please call him and he put his number on that as well. So, so far we've had three people pay their dues. So our numbers are starting to climb. I also wanted to report that the annual meeting, which will be in October up in Houston, we will know by July 1st, if they're gonna offer both a virtual and in person. And then the registration for both, if, if it's both will be as of August 1st. So be watching for that. Well, I'm still, I'm sorry, but I'm still not in a hundred percent shape and I still trailing in doctor's office on and off. So, uh, hello to everyone. Well, we hope they can help address the issues you're having with your eyes and um, they can at least stabilize them uh, and maybe help you somewhat with their vision problems you're having. Uh, we wish you the best in that. That's right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Advanced Training director, director, we are continuing to forward AT opportunities, although I've not seen a whole lot out there. I know Elizabeth's been busy moving, so I tried to forward some information as needed. So between us, we'll get it all done and uh, be sure you know some of those AT opportunities. I did mention the TMN Tuesdays. Uh, July 12th at noon is going to be the next one. And uh, we're combining that with the president's meeting because they want to make a pitch about uh, leadership and how nonprofit leaders can transmit leadership to other members of the team. So members of the team, if you want to find out more about leadership in the TMN, we encourage you to tune into that July 12th 
noon presentation on TMN Tuesdays, and they usually send out a registration beforehand for that. Um, and then she had already mentioned the annual meeting in Houston. And I didn't ever see Susan on here, but she's on Denver time. Um, I have added uh, some um, uh, volunteer opportunities here. Uh, Keith Matsalana has had summer camp this June and July, and they will be needing volunteers. You might check in with them. And then we discussed it at our um, uh, board meeting, and uh, the Texas Historical Commission has some handouts that they wanted uh, translating into Spanish. And I said, you know, some of those pertain to um, the archaeology and um, uh, stewardship of the land, which is part of our program, too. And so um, uh, the board approved that as a virtual, a chapter virtual opportunity. And um, I haven't seen it yet. And I know Ronnie's been really busy, but he was going to create an opportunity. But anybody who's interested in those, they sent me four for translating. So if we have a couple, three, four members that want to try that and translate those uh, little flyers, then um, uh, we'll get that to you and you can do some virtual volunteer work. Um, is there any other old business? Otherwise, I just have a few announcements I want to make. Is there anything anybody else needs to bring up or discuss? Oh, I was just going to mention, if, uh, if you are looking for AT opportunities, there's uh, a lot more places having uh, night hikes or guided tours. Um, those count as AT opportunities for us. So um, check out the parks, look on their Facebook pages. Uh, there, there's stuff happening now. Okay, very I'll good. Get, did y'all get to see the astronaut that's a master naturalist in space? That was this last week and it was, um... I, I was out in the field and did not have Wi-Fi or anything, so I did not get to see that. But I caught the last half of it. If you get a chance, you got to see it. It's amazing. I was going to say it is recorded. I, most of yeah. those are, yeah. They have a dragonfly for their patch or on their patch, which is oh, really fantastic. And then one other thing, if any of you, and Anita mentioned it, the South Texas Eco Center. If you have not been there, you really will enjoy it. All the native plants and the ski slope. I love that. <laughs> All right. It looks like a ski slope anyway. It's an overlook. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to make a last few announcements. We, the board confirmed Mary Baker as our Winter Texans director. She'll take over directorship um, of that position. And um, I know we were going to work on who, which of our members are Winter Texans and which are not, and so we can help address any needs they have. Um, I know the past couple of years we've been able to offer things virtually, and so we're going to look at whether or not that was a good a good move for them, or or and how we might be sure and involve them in the summer months when they may not be here. So Mary Baker offered to do that, and we did not let her off the hook. We said, that's great. Um, I already mentioned the chapter donation for sponsorship at the annual meeting. Our next board meeting uh, normally would have been scheduled for July 4th, but since that's a holiday, we agreed to hold it on July 11th. And so, uh, but then our um, general meeting will be the following week. And in July, we have Dr. Duke talking about hydrology of the regional drainage and then uh, Elizabeth has gotten busy and she has us August through October uh, programs scheduled and those are on the list if you want to look those and she's looking at a field trip in the fall with uh, Nick Morales to talk about geology of the area. Okay is there any other business or any other comments questions Elizabeth you want to go ahead we, we can't hear you. Elizabeth, we're not hearing you. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Dr. Jude Benavides is the July speaker, and he'll be talking about the formation and the importance of the Risakas in our region, as well as the uh, hydrology and the uh, effect drought and population growth in the area has had on our local water um, 
supply. So that should be very interesting. And what was his name again? Jude Benavides. Oh, Jude Benavides. Okay. Yeah, he's a professor at UTRGV in the Brownsville campus. All right. All right. Well, I have it at 734, and that's, uh, is there any other business anybody needs to bring up? If not, we will close this business meeting, and that was right at 15 minutes, the point two five, and that rounds out the hour. Everybody have a good evening. Thank you for tuning in and attending the business meeting, and uh, get out there and do some observations or trim those lantanas. I'm going to go do mine. I've been wondering what was bothering them. Now I know. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight, and have a good week. Bye. Bye. Adios. Bye, everyone. Bye.